tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. Two seemingly unrelated cases lay dormant for years until two veteran California criminalists employ the latest in DNA profiling technology to prove an unidentified serial rapist and an unknown serial killer are one and the same. Authorities now need your help to catch a notorious murderer who has preyed on California since at least 1976. Donna Baldio finds a threatening note outside the bank where she works demanding money. The author of the note threatens violent retaliation if Donna does not heed the warning. Five weeks later, a deadly fire erupts outside of her apartment. Coincidence? Or was Donna Baldio the target of a vicious extortionist? An alarming number of children in a rural western town are diagnosed with leukemia. Two have already lost their lives. What is happening in Fallon, Nevada to create what doctors call a cancer cluster? A well-known Colorado family man responded to a call for help and never came back. Could the stranded motorist who placed the distress call have had anything to do with the disappearance of Dale Williams? Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Or perhaps you may encounter one that simply cannot be explained. October 1976, an affluent suburb outside Sacramento, California. I remember waking up with a flashlight shining in my face. <laughs> and I was looking down the barrel of a gun, and he said, uh, don't move, don't make a sound, or I will kill you. Give me your hand. And Within a moment's notice, my life was all of a sudden in the control of somebody else. You just do as I tell you. The rape victim, whose identity we're not revealing at her request, is one of more than 40 women believed to have been assaulted by a man who terrorized the Sacramento area during the 1970s. The mysterious attacker known to police as the East Area Rapist was never identified. Incredibly, more than 20 years later, Dramatic advances in law enforcement technology determined that the same man was responsible for a series of murders in the 1980s. Authorities seek your help in tracking down a suspect who's eluded police for nearly 30 years. During the 1970s, the man who would defy detection for decades established himself as a unique offender with unusual signature habits, including boldly lingering in victims' homes for hours. I know that at some point he was out in the living room smoking, and the police felt that he maybe had gotten into my refrigerator. I think he was in the house anywhere from two and a half to three hours. I lay there for what seemed like a long period of time with no noise, and then all of a sudden, I couldn't see, I couldn't move, and I couldn't yell. And I remember wondering, is this it? Is this the way I'm gonna die? Eventually, after sexually assaulting his victim, the rapist would quietly sneak away. Can you tell me maybe a little of what he looked like? Detective Carol Daly interviewed many of the rapist's oh, victims. A mask. The East Area Rapist very definitely did a psychological rape along with the physical rape. In the manner in which he would threaten the victims, the length of time that he stayed in the home. Richard? His crime was different and unique. Did you find anything? For Lieutenant Richard Shelby, this would become one of the most demanding cases of his career. Okay. Thanks. It was a high priority. It had a lot of publicity. 
He had a lot of victims. The guy's dangerous. Our office and city police both had special teams working it. Give me an evidence back. Evidence recovered near two crime scenes indicated the rapist had spied on his victims before he struck. Well, it casts all of us, too. He prowled the area. He knew it well. See? Sit right here and look right in her window. Some of the cases, he knew the victims, he knew their time, their schedule, he knew that of the neighbors, and some of them were crime of opportunity. They weren't supposed to be there, there they were, so he took advantage of it. The first 15 attacks occurred in homes only inhabited by women and children, but then the rapist became even more brazen. He targeted homes in which a man was also present. When the rapist would come in, he would at gunpoint, order the female to tie up the, the male in the house. And then he would remove the female to the other part of the house where he would also tie her up. And then he would put the dishes on the husband. If I hear one plate rattle, I'll kill everyone in the house. While he was in the other room occupied with the sexual assault, he could hear whether or not the male was trying to get free. I can't think of any other rapes that I worked other than this one, where a suspect was willing to go in and do the types of things that the East Area Rapists did when there were other people in the house. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. We there was so much fear in the community, and there were so many rumors out there about what the East Area Rapist was doing, so we were holding town hall meetings. I understand. I, we understand your concern. Yeah. They were incensed to think that a man could have been in the home when these rapes occurred and not have done anything about it. Look, you don't need to worry about In this particular meeting, a gentleman got up and said, I don't believe that could happen. But if he ever comes into my house, I'm going to be ready. That man and his wife would later become victims. It led me to believe that the rapist was in the audience that night and probably followed this couple home. If we could have I think that he liked the excitement of the game. I think it was as much a game with the investigators as it was for what he was doing to the victims. The sadistic game being played by the rapist often extended beyond the attack itself. Hello. Several victims reported Hello. receiving disturbing phone calls from the rapist years later. Who is this? I felt by what he said to me that he had been still watching me and stalking me. I felt absolutely terrified. I think the phone calls were just his way of saying, you're still my hostage. Even though I'm not in your house, psychologically, you're still my hostage. By the late 1970s, the East Area Rapist had moved west to communities in Contra Costa County, 50 miles from Sacramento. Authorities traced five more sexual assaults to him there before the attacks abruptly stopped. And everybody speculated on, on where this guy might have gone and why he, went, why he might have stopped. And there was nowhere to go with it. We had no real physical description. Years passed. The trail grew colder. Then 400 miles south at the Orange County, California Sheriff's Department, Forensic scientist Mary Hong compared semen samples from several unsolved rape murders in the Southern California area and linked the crimes to the same perpetrator. Meanwhile, back in Contra Costa County, Sheriff's Department criminalist Paul Holes ran DNA profiles on semen recovered from the East Area Rapist assaults in his county. Then in 2001, Paul Holes contacted Mary Hong. Let me grab that file. Independently, he was thinking that this guy has to be committing these crimes somewhere else. So he actually was calling these agencies and finding out if they had any cases that fit his profile. OK, I've got D3, 15, 16. I had him read me the profile BWA, that he had 14, on his case. 15. OK. And I compared that to the profile that I had in our cases, and they matched all the way across. Wow, looks like we've got a match. At that okay, point, that, uh, we knew that we had okay. just connected the series of sexual assaults in Northern California with a series of homicides down in Southern California. We felt before he left Sacramento that he was ready to kill. His behavior was becoming more and more bizarre, and the threats that he was making to the victims were uh, more severe. His, uh, just his demeanor was changing. 
the East Area Rapist had become a Southern California killer, leaving a trail of deaths in his wake. Charlene and Lyman Smith of Ventura, newlyweds Keith and Patty Harrington of Laguna Niguel, Manuela Withhune of Irvine. Five years later, the next murder took place on May 5, 1986. Janelle Cruz also lived in Irvine. Like the others, she had been tied up, sexually assaulted, and bludgeoned to death in her home. Larry Poole of the Orange County Sheriff's Department has headed up the Southern California investigation. We don't have anything that we've linked to him after May 5th of 1986. Doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, doesn't mean that it's not out there for us to acquire. We're just not aware of it. However, based on the killer's MO, Larry Poole has come to believe that the man he's pursuing also murdered two couples in Santa Barbara before and after the string of cases connected by DNA began. I don't know of anyone like him. He's a very unique offender. 50 rapes that we're aware of, 10 murders that we're aware of, we suspect that he's probably responsible for more rapes and murders and crimes uh, outside of what we've identified. With a biological link to the Northern California rapes confirmed, investigators now had 50 additional cases to comb through in search of new clues to the serial killer's identity. The East Area Rapist MO of stacking plates on the victim's partner during the assault is believed to be particularly unique. It's a signature aspect of our offender. Is it possible that someone abused him and treated him the same way? Terrorizing him, perhaps, as a boy when he grew up, it's, it's possible. If the old police adage of serial killers do not stop unless they're caught is true, how is it possible this one hasn't been heard from since 1986? He could be dead, he could be disabled, and is no longer capable of doing what he once did as a serial killer. He could have moved to another state, changed his MO somewhat, and uh, has committed multiple offenses that he's been identified for, and we've just yet to link him up. Larry Poole believes there's another possibility, that this serial killer could be incarcerated, perhaps on death row for an unrelated murder. Poole advocates DNA testing of every death row inmate. However, in California, investigators are blocked by an injunction that prohibits the extraction of blood from any prisoner on death row against his will. There are approximately 600 men who are among California's most heinous, notorious criminals who do not have DNA profiles compared against the data bank. I think that we need to do whatever we possibly can to identify him. Um, and to miss that opportunity, I, I think, is, is, is criminal. Please, somebody out there has to know something about this person. And if the information could come forward, will it ever bring closure to the victims? Only that they would feel safe that he is not out there to attack again. I don't want to end my career without having solved this. And if it's not solved by the time I retire, I'll think about it till the day I die. Chateau Dijon Apartments, Houston, 3.30 a.m. On February 1st, 2002, Curtis Ford awoke to a series of strange sounds in the stairwell outside his apartment. The banging that I heard sounded like a herd of elephants running up the stairs. And then I heard, which was like a knock at the door. And then I heard the same right down the stairs. So I looked up, and this wall of fire just shot out my side balcony window, just shot straight up and out. It was like my whole apartment lit up. I couldn't believe the, the amount of 
force that this thing had. Curtis escaped the fire unscathed. Three of his neighbors would not be so lucky. The fire at the Chateau Dijon apartments was quickly ruled arson. Few details have been released as to exactly how the blaze started, but authorities say it may not have been a random act, that the arsonist was possibly trying to harm a specific resident of the building. That person was Donna Baldio. Donna Baldio lived a quiet life with her 22-year-old son, Jylel Lewis, and eight-year-old daughter, Bunny Sue Terry. By all accounts, the family was close and had no enemies. But several weeks prior to the fire, a disturbing incident may have given someone motive to attack Donna. Donna Baldio had worked at Wells Fargo Bank for 10 years. She was currently a manager at a drive through branch located outside of Houston. On December 22nd, Donna was the first to arrive at work. She immediately noticed an odd piece of paper lying in front of the bank's entrance. Encased in a protective plastic sheath was a note. It demanded all the money from the bank, and if anyone called the police, they would face dire consequences. It was a well-crafted note, well-verbalized, and specifically threatened employees if they didn't cooperate in turning over all the bank's money that day, that they would be retaliated against. Donna retreated to her car. Five minutes later, another employee showed up. Don't stop, just follow me. They drove to a nearby convenience store and contacted their supervisor who called police. I pulled up like normal, uh, parked the car, started walking. Donna had done exactly what the note had explicitly instructed her not to do. Authorities found no fingerprints on the note, nor were there any clues as to who the author might be. So the investigation it. never turned up a suspect. Move on. OK. Thank While you. investigators had no evidence that pointed directly at the suspects leaving this note for Donna Baldio personally, she is the person who found it. And in this instance, Donna Baldio did not comply. Five weeks later, the blaze erupted in the stairwell at Donna's apartment building. Donna's unit was one of two located on the second floor. Two more units were downstairs. Authorities speculate that Donna's daughter, Bunny, was awakened by the mysterious knock. Unaware of the inferno outside, she opened the door. Bunny, stop! No! Bunny! Donna and her son, Jai, then ran into the flames, desperate to rescue her. <laughs> oh, Curtis Ford, Donna's downstairs neighbor, witnessed the unfolding nightmare. Jai's laying there on the landing, and I, I saw him burning, and I just grabbed his ankle and I pulled him down, you know. And he was just like screaming at the top of his lungs, like, my sister's dead. I mean, he just couldn't believe the fact of this going on. I mean, it was just horrible, horrible, horrible. Curtis saw Donna repeatedly enter the flames. Horrifying screams for her youngest child went unanswered. The look on her face just would break any person. I mean, I couldn't sleep for the next two months because of it. Emergency workers arrived at the apartment complex within minutes. Donna and her children were the only victims of the fire. Donna and Jai had been critically burned over their entire bodies. They barely clung to life, hysterical over Bunny's fate. When the smoke finally cleared, the eight-year-old was found dead in the stairwell. This was absolutely one of the most horrible events I've seen in my 30 years in the fire department because they were literally burned alive there. Donna and Jai were rushed to the hospital. Friends and family gathered around their bedsides, hoping for a miraculous recovery. You couldn't even recognize him. You couldn't even recognize Jai, and you couldn't even recognize Donna. And so we came out, we were just devastated. Jai was pronounced dead at 10.30 that morning. Donna followed her son one half hour later. An entire family was gone. Who would have committed such an appalling crime and why? Was this a reprisal threatened by the extortionist? Or perhaps there is another equally tragic explanation. 
It has been reported that over the past three years, 15 fires have broken out at the Chateau Dijon apartment complex. Her death and her children's death could be related to the series of arsons in that same apartment complex, including one that happened on the same stairwell just a year before. When the dust settles on this, it's, it's probably gonna be somebody that she knew, and I just got that feeling about that, that this is more of uh, somebody that got mad at her for whatever reason, no one knows why. Fallon, Nevada, population 8,000. For those who moved here, it seemed like the perfect place to escape the urban sprawl and raise a family. But there is something terrible happening to the children of Fallon. You go, burger. It all began with dust and gross. Honey, where'd you get this bruise? I fall off of my back. When I was giving him a bath, I noticed bruises on his back and his arms, and I asked him what was he doing, um, why did he have these bruises, and he told me he was playing uh, with his friend on the big wheels. And I thought, okay, that makes sense. That's where the bruises come from. Honey, what are you doing home? Uh, well, he's been tired all day. But then the next day, my husband had noticed a lot more bruises and brought it up to my attention. See, please. I saw he had bruises all over his body, his arms, his legs, his stomach, um, his back, and little red blood specks on the surface of his skin. And I knew that um, something was wrong at that point. You're gonna feel all better. Brenda took Dustin to the local hospital and he was immediately transferred to the UC Davis Medical Center. Blood was drawn, a diagnosis was made. The doctor told us that Dustin had leukemia. I knew what leukemia was. I knew it was a cancer, but I didn't actually realize how severe. Brenda soon learned the seriousness of Dustin's condition. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia strikes children usually between the ages of two and nine. It causes the production of millions of defective white blood cells, destroying the immune system and can be fatal. Dustin immediately underwent aggressive chemotherapy. You want to take your pills? I've never went through anything like that before in my life. Um, not knowing Good boy. what to expect, what my child's going through, um, seeing him lie there so lethargic and so lifeless. I think that that's probably the hardest thing that I've ever had to deal with. Um, it was not easy. Dustin Gross was not alone. Over the next two years, 14 more children contracted childhood leukemia in the Fallon area, an astronomical number in a community so small. Two have lost their lives. Authorities are now convinced that the outbreak is not a coincidence. Parents are in a state of panic, desperate to find answers before more children become ill and possibly die. Within weeks of Dustin Gross's diagnosis, two more children came down with childhood leukemia. The cancer treatment facility at the local hospital, run by RN Barbara de Braga, was overwhelmed. Even at that point, I was just thinking, it's just coincidence. It's just a terrible coincidence, but it's a coincidence. But then shortly after the third, then we got a referral for a fourth. Barbara de Braga feared that she was looking at an abnormally high occurrence of the disease known as a cancer cluster. She contacted the state assembly person for the Fallon area, and an official investigation was launched. A state epidemiologist, Dr. Randall Todd, prepared an all-out inquiry. The devastating disease threatened a spin out of control, striking victims number five and six. A couple of days after there was a seventh case diagnosed, 
And so this started to, to kind of make the hair on the back of my neck stand up a little bit. It was, it was a frightening time. But we have a series of questions we want to go over with you, and okay. we're going to use this office right here. OK. That's OK. An alarm Dr. Todd immediately sought a common denominator shared by all the victims that might explain the epidemic. Could it be an environmental toxin? And uh, how is the water supplied to that house? Is it? It's a well. It's a well. well. So Interviews with parents, however, produced no answers, and Dr. Todd watched helplessly as new cases continued to appear. Zach Beersley was a ninth child diagnosed with childhood leukemia. When I heard I was number nine in a cancer cluster, at that time, my child was so ill that all I could think about was how do I get out of this mess with a healthy child? After I found my feet, if you will, I realized that it was important to get involved in the investigation. And that's when I found the strength and rolled my sleeves up and said, well, what can I do? And then you start to fight and you don't look back, you know. Tammy Beersley readily opened her house to a phalanx of scientists. The search for the common denominator continued. What did all these children share that might explain their illness? There was a team of people that came into our home and vacuumed, took dust samples, air quality samples, water samples, uh, biological testing, they scraped our mouths, uh, blood tests. But these tests were inconclusive. Perhaps the problem was not in the children's homes, but in the surrounding environment. Was there something unique about Fallon that could explain why a cancer cluster appeared here? Researchers began with the water. The one thing that, that makes this community sort of stand out is that they have one of the highest rates of naturally occurring arsenic in their water supply of any place in the nation. Researchers also found mercury in a nearby lake and several irrigation canals, places where the children were known to play. And there was another unusual feature about Fallon that raised red flags. Residential homes are freely intermixed with farmland. They have to, uh, to treat these fields with uh, pesticides and fertilizer and this type of thing, so you're now having that very close to the living community rather than maybe in a normal farming community where it starts uh, on the outskirts of town. Radioactivity was also a possibility. Underground atomic tests were conducted near Fallon during the 1960s. Arsenic, mercury, pesticides. There seemed to be no shortage of toxins in the environment. Incredibly, scientists have so far failed to link any of them to the outbreak. In fact, no studies have ever demonstrated that these contaminants play a role in contracting childhood leukemia. Working on this really is like trying to do a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. What we can say is that, in fact, we likely will not have the complete puzzle put together at the end of this investigation. There was one final possibility. Fallon is located 10 miles from a major naval air station used to train fighter pilots. The jet fuel contains benzene, a known carcinogen. There is a pipeline which transports jet fuel. The pipe comes right through and underneath Fallon and, and winds up at the Fallon Naval Air Station. Uh, we wondered, was there uh, fuel getting into the water supply? but we didn't find any evidence that the water had been contaminated with jet fuel. Perhaps the residents of Fallon were inhaling the jet fuel? This theory is currently being tested on laboratory mice at the University of Arizona. Human trials may take place in the near future. We can actually measure on a person's expired breath uh, remnants of, of jet fuel exposure. That, that technology has been developed over the last five years. 
While authorities search for answers, the parents of the children suffering from leukemia in Fallon try to remain optimistic. Zach Beersley has been undergoing chemotherapy for the past 17 months. Although he is responding well, it is still too soon to know if he'll beat the disease. There's a, a, a fear inside of me. I have two other children and one on the way, and I'd like to find out what's making children become diagnosed with leukemia here before I bring another child into the world. After two years of intensive chemotherapy, Dustin Gross recently had an end of treatment party. His cancer is currently in remission, but there is always the fear that it may one day return. I am worried um, for my family and my other children and for Dustin still. I will never give up on pushing the research to find what has caused childhood leukemia and a cluster in this community. Obviously, the more research and continued research is going to get us closer and closer. And I feel that we will find it, um, but we cannot let up. Sunday, July 4th, a family swimming at the confluence of the San Miguel and Dolores Rivers in western Colorado made a grim discovery. Submerged in the muddy waters was a pickup truck. The Montrose County Sheriff's Department responded to the scene, and it quickly became apparent that this would be more than a simple vehicle recovery operation. Investigators realized this might be the break they desperately needed in a case that had captured the attention of surrounding communities. A truck belonged to a man who suddenly vanished six weeks before. Hopes, however, were quickly dashed when no other signs of the missing man were recovered. Authorities need your help to solve this baffling mystery. The recovered pickup truck was registered to 42-year-old Dale Williams. The longtime area resident was a devoted husband and doting father of two teenage daughters. Dale owned and operated an auto body shop in the nearby town of Nucla. On the evening of May 27th, Dale failed to make it home for dinner. His wife, Diana, assumed he was preoccupied with a job at the body shop and lost track of time. By bedtime, however, Diana was concerned. Hi, Dale. It's me. Uh, I called the shop a couple of times and no answer. Okay, give me a call as soon as you get in. Bye-bye. So I thought, well, maybe he just didn't hear the phone because he's using the air ratchets or something. You know, I went to bed about 10, and I laid there, and I felt like something was wrong. I tossed and turned all night, woke up several times, and he still wasn't home. Diana woke at dawn and was horrified to discover Dale had not made it home all night. As soon as she got her kids off to school, Diana drove straight to Dale's garage. Dale? When I first walked in the shop, the door was unlocked. Dale? The hood was still up on the van. His tools were, they were just laying around the vehicle, like you just walked away from it for a few minutes. Went over to my mother-in-law's, and she hadn't heard from him the day before or that morning. Dale often shopped at junkyards, looking for spare parts to use at the body shop. When was the last time you Diana and her mother-in-law thought that would be a good place to start their search. When we didn't find him at the junkyard, we thought we'd probably find him along the way the road somewhere where he'd maybe ran off the road. We felt like that something had happened to him for sure, but we felt like we would find him. But as it happened, we didn't find him. 
Within a few hours, Diana Williams notified police, and word of Dale Williams' strange disappearance spread through Nucla. Investigators began piecing together Dale Williams' day. They learned Dale made a brief stop at Tammy Lorenz's office about 12.15 that afternoon. I had a windshield that I needed repaired on a, a truck of ours. Hey, Dale, what's up? Listen, I stopped by to let you know that I can't do your windshield until next Wednesday. That's OK. I thought it was strange that Dale stopped in because he didn't have to stop and tell me. He could have called me. Dale was in a hurry. He told Tammy he was on his way to help a stranded motorist. Maybe he felt uneasy about who he was going to go give a tow. I really don't know. All right, see you later. Bye. That was the last time that I saw Dale Williams. The investigators determined that Dale's friend, Tom Ross, had been with him just before Tammy saw him. You got an arm. Tom and his young son had stopped by the body shop late that morning. We was just getting close to the noon hour, and he said, I'm real busy today. I got a full shop. But he said, I got time for one game of darts if you want to, if you got time. I said, yeah, sure. Yeah, nice job, Bob. Nice job. Now, hold on a second. Wow, well, phone call come in. Hello? And they were broke down. They said about three quarters of a mile east of the Bedrock uh, Colorado store, just a little country store. Yeah, yeah, I think I know where that is. I was okay. under the impression that it might have been a, a lady that called. Nothing that was actually said, it was just the way he talked okay. and stuff. Yeah, no, it's the, it's the other road, I, I, it's the only way to go. Dale's okay, shop at auto body repair. He was not a mechanic, so it was unusual for him to receive a call for roadside help. I, I did feel odd that uh, uh, they called Dale for assistance. Sorry, you guys. Uh, I'm going to have to take off. But at the same time, Dale was one that uh, was willing to go and help somebody if they were broke down. We said our goodbyes at the shop door. That's the last time I ever saw Dale. The citizens of Nuclear responded to the emergency situation. Missing posters were printed up and distributed by Dale's friends and family. It makes me feel really great to know I'm in a small town and everybody cares. However, Diana would soon come to understand that not everyone in her small town did care. We had missing posters up and, and I noticed I put some in the post office and about two days later, they were all gone. So I put some more in there and they just, two or three days, they disappear. That ultimately resulted in us uh, installing a, uh, a hidden camera in the post office in Nucla. And that led to us being able to determine who was responsible uh, for the disappearance of those flyers. Within a few weeks, the camera hidden by police captured images of this man tearing down the flyers. Incredibly, he was ultimately identified as a former longtime family friend of Dale and Diana Williams. The individual depicted in the photographs was questioned, and uh, he denied any involvement uh, in Dale's disappearance. He also was able to uh, give us an alibi uh, for the 27th of May, 1999. Uh, and for the most part, that alibi uh, is consistent uh, and has been confirmed. Could Dale's disappearance have had anything to do with some bad blood between the two men? 12 months before Dale vanished, Diana and Dale helped move the mystery man's ex-wife to another state without his knowledge. He was angry at Dale for helping his ex-wife move and get clear out of the area. And then we wouldn't tell him where she was at or anything like that. And I feel like he was really angry with Dale for that. A month after helping the man's ex-wife move, Dale found some disturbing items outside his auto body shop. He went to work. He noticed some pictures torn up there, just laying all over the ground. The torn photographs had been stolen from his shop. They depicted Dale and Diana with their now-divorced friends in happier times. Several 22 caliber bullets were also scattered across the ground. Several days after that, Diana made a strange discovery in the night drop box at the video rental store she ran, a 22 caliber revolver. 
Diana and Dale later discovered the gun, like the torn photos, had also been stolen from Dale's auto body shop. I was really nervous because I didn't know what to think. And Dale just told me to not worry about it. Things will be OK. And things will settle down. Whatever happened, it was more to scare him, he felt like, than anything. Police interviewed Dale's former friend about the burglaries, but he denied any involvement in the break-in. Dale's life seemed to return to normal. Then 11 months after his body shop was burglarized, Dale Williams suddenly disappeared. Six weeks later, Dale's truck was recovered from the river. An analysis of the vehicle and its recovery site provided more clues. The truck's ignition was turned on, the vehicle was in gear, and the angle between the highway and the river was extremely sharp. Each detail seemed to indicate that someone had deliberately steered Dale Williams' truck into the water. Once Diana viewed photographs of Dale's truck, she was certain someone other than her husband last drove the vehicle. She took particular note of the partially open driver's side window. Dale usually drove with the driver's window all the way down, but never halfway. Always down or up. Somebody put it in there to get rid of it. Somebody who knew the river. Generating further speculation, police have not located the stranded motorist Dale Williams went to help. Was a mystery caller a woman, as Dale's friend surmised? And why has that person never come forward? Go there. Investigators may already have that answer. The purported distress call was placed from a stolen cell phone. Dale Williams' loved ones must also face yet another perplexing scenario. There are those who claim that Dale's truck was parked in this normal spot at his body shop by 1.30 p.m. the day he vanished. If true, Dale or someone else drove his truck back into town within 90 minutes of his responding to the distress call outside of town. There were even reports from witnesses who claimed to have seen Dale Williams early that evening at a market in the neighboring town of Natorita. I do believe that the people who saw Dale Williams between 5 and 6 o'clock at the local grocery store did in fact see Dale, and that they are people in the community that their word can be trusted. So what happened to Dale Williams, and where is he now? I believe Dale either seen something he shouldn't have or knew something he shouldn't have, and somebody was looking to shut him up. Maybe he was ready to go to the cops and tell what he knew, and that was their way of shutting him up. Dale Williams has not been seen since May 27, 1999. He stands 5 foot 7 inches tall and has light sandy hair and blue eyes. Join us next time on Unsolved Mysteries.